The Rhodesian Bush War was a war of decolonization between methods of terrorism and insurgency by the Zimbabwe African People's Union and Zimbabwe African National Union, where from 1964 to 1979 they fought bravely against a well-equipped Rhodesian army. In this video, we will be covering not only the war, but the foundations of Rhodesia, how war broke out, and how Rhodesia lost. The story begins in the late 19th century with, unexpectedly, British colonisation. This was where Cecil Rhodes, a mining magnate and leader of the British South Africa Company, or for short BSAC, led an expedition to invade the lands that were Rhodesia in 1890, which was at the time ruled by the tribal king, Lobengula, leader of the northern Nevedeli people. Lobengula was fully aware of the significant technological differences between their two groups, and to avoid bloodshed, conceded to Rhodes, allowing him to claim the Moshona land region for the BSAC, where he set up a series of ring forts to guard the land. Soon after, the company fabricated a claim that the Nabadeli had started a war with the company, giving Cecil a chance to fully conquer the region. With the promise of lush farms and plenty of mines, Cecil has quickly taken up arms and marched on the Nabadeli capital of Gabulawayo, and twice faced off King Lobangula's unorganised and ill-equipped forces. With the capital captured and the king in retreat, the territories controlled by the Nevedeli were quickly carved up into farms and mines, the tribes heard distributed among the settlers, and a new frontier town was constructed, Bulawayo, on top of the now-destroyed Gabulawayo. With the arrival of World War I, many white men from Rhodesia were called up to fight. There was even a regiment for the native Africans, the Rhodesia Native Regiment, who saw action in German East Africa. The creation of this regiment was controversial, however, as many feared the soldiers fighting could use their training and arms for a future rebellion against the white settlers. Discriminatory policies to keep the white minority government in power would become more common as Rhodesia was given more autonomy in 1923. But with the hard-hitting Great Depression, there would be a rise in racial divisions in Rhodesia. This would be fermented in 1930, with the Land Apportionment Act being passed, dividing the country's land between the whites, who usually received the more fertile areas, and the blacks, who received the more arid areas. Due to this unfair law, many blacks would protest, as seen in the Bulawayo General Strike in 1948. Economically, Rhodesia done very well throughout its existence, even during wartime, with their top exports being chromium and tobacco, and coupled with a post-war boom, meant that Rhodesia became a comfortable place to settle down. As from 1945 to 1970, 200,000 whites would emigrate to Rhodesia. Guess I'll repent, but we're all Rhodesians and we'll fight through the campaign. Rhodesia's 1962 election saw the conservative Rhodesian Front Party come to power. This would bring in Winston Field as Prime Minister and Ian Smith as Deputy Prime Minister, who were both very much opposed to a black majority rule. Faced with a growing internal crisis, the Rhodesian government began an expansion of the armed forces, training their troops in counter-insurgency operations, giving the Air Force modern aircraft such as the Hawker Hunters and Alouette helicopters, and drafting all white males, 18 to 50, into the Territorial Force, a type of reserve army. By this point, the parties of Zapu, led by Joshua Nakomo, and Zanu, led by Neda Bengale Sithole, had been formed, with the aim of establishing a black majority rule in Rhodesia. In 1964, Ian Smith became Prime Minister after Winston Field's resignation. However, there was a sense of growing isolation and fear, as Britain cut off ties with Rhodesia due to their refusal to give in to a black majority rule. The last draw from uneasy peace to total war was when ZANU supporters killed a white man named Peter Oberholzer. This gave the Rhodesian government a reason to begin imprisoning their political opponents. When it became clear the Rhodesian government would not give in unlike their other colonial counterparts, the parties of ZANU and ZAPU fled to exile in the neighbouring black rural countries to begin waging a guerrilla war. Not long after, a unilateral declaration of independence was signed on the 11th of November 1965, setting the stage for a conflict to commence. In response, the United Nations called Rhodesia nothing more than an imperial renegade 
and imposed embargoes on 90% of Rhodesia's exports, barred Rhodesia from importing oil, and banned all United Nations member states from supplying Rhodesia with arms. Before we delve into the opening stages of the conflict, we should know what the guerrillas were up against. Most Rhodesian army recruits would at first face up to two months of basic infantry drills followed by intensive gun drills. In total, the average soldier's training program would last up to two years, and when in the field, they were urged to refrain from automatic fire due to the scarcity of ammunition, as a lot of their equipment was locally made. Much of Rhodesia was still untamed bushland, so many units were shuttled to and from the battlefields by air or would patrol on foot. And with the borders to patrol reaching 2,000 miles, it would be no easy feat to make sure all the borders were protected. To counter this, the Rhodesian army would be split up into four fire forces. These were mobile strike units and would mostly be deployed via parachute across the country where they would surprise and overwhelm the insurgents. They would be commanded by experienced officers, many of whom were trained in the United Kingdom's Sandhurst Military Academy. Overall, they were a much more trained and provisioned army when compared to the neighbours of Zambia and Mozambique. ZANU and ZAPU insurgents, on the other hand, are very much comparable to an incompetent version of the Viet Cong. For a great majority of the conflict, they would set up underground bases and depots and ambush Rhodesian patrols and civilian targets. They were told to often switch their guns to automatic fire to scare Rhodesian troops and to increase the probability of hits when fighting in the dense bushland. Training varied between the two groups. Many ZAPU insurgents received training in the Soviet Union where they would later return and train their comrades in what they learned. Whilst ZANU were less reliant on foreign powers, however the vast majority of both ZAPU and ZANU forces failed to grasp even basic guerrilla tactics and would often discharge in an undisciplined mess. There were also many after action reports of the guerrillas poorly maintaining their guns. There were even reports of the indestructible AK-47s were being found broken the guerrillas were also left in the dark when they crossed the border, as they had no means of contacting their bases in neighbouring countries. Now for the actual conflict. 